Well, thank you very much to everybody for joining. Um, so my name is, is Paul Nolte. I am a uh, architectural and architectural lighting designer based here in London. Um, but uh, we also have offices in uh, Beirut, Miami, Bangkok, and also uh, Dubai. So here we are standing in the desert looking uh, like a pop group, I think. Um, so uh, yeah, we get around a little bit as a, as a practice. Now, uh, we are architectural lighting designers and we work on a number of projects uh, across the world really for many different brands. Um, people like Manchester United, Nike, to this is a hotel uh, in um, central London called The Ned, which is sort of the trendiest place to visit uh, at the moment, uh, to exterior projects like the IFC uh, Coffee Zone in uh, Dubai, through to uh, airports. We also work on, uh, this is Kefla Big Airport, where we recreated uh, the Aurora Borealis uh, a few years ago as part of their um, drive to create greater levels of tourism. Uh, we work on things like museums, uh, wellness clinics and, and spas and facilities, uh, right the way through to uh, more retail here um, in, in Kuwait. Um, this was uh, the Bloomingdale store. So we know a thing or two uh, about light and its effect on, uh, on people. Um, so we are architectural lighting designers, as I say. I often find at this point, it's probably best to define what architectural lighting design is not. Uh, and the reason I do that is because I'm normally presenting to lots of architects, interior designers, maybe some lighting manufacturers or suppliers. And there's often a, a quite a large debate uh, around what constitutes good architectural lighting design. And I'm a believer, much to the consternation of many of my uh, peers, I'm a believer that good ar architectural lighting design is not the domain of just the lighting design. It's not just people like me that can do good lighting design. I think it can be done by anybody and everybody that selects light fixtures. Um, but it's important, I think, to define what it's not, because then we start to define what the essence uh, of lighting design is, or the arts of lighting design. So architectural lighting is, design is very much not about product. It is not about opening a catalog and finding the latest and the greatest product that's been designed by a wonderful Italian manufacturer. Um, it's important, it's a tool. Uh, those products are a tool, but just choosing the product does not create a scheme. Uh, equally, you know, just pleasing the builder, particularly in the Middle East where we work on a lot of design and build contracts. Often the contractor has an awful lot of power um, and it's great that we please him because we make it nice and easy to build, but that doesn't make it a good piece of lighting design. Equally, you're looking at or picking up the technical guidelines and there is a difference between guidelines and legislation and accreditation. Um, but picking up those guidelines and simply ticking a box that says, yes, I've achieved this much light, this much lux uh, or this much candelas meter squared. Just simply achieving those levels of light are, are not you know, good or does not constitute a good piece of lighting design. You know, quantity and quality are very, very different things. Um, simply creating a design that is affordable and within budget, well, that doesn't make it good either. Um, it does need to be affordable. You know, every client has to, um, you know, achieve their budget, um, whatever those budget constraints are. And as we move forward in a post-COVID world, I think we're going to find that budgets are going to get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed um, for sure. But it uh, just being affordable doesn't make it a good piece of lighting design either. As I mentioned before, simply achieving legislation and accreditation, well, great, you know, that, that, that we tick the box, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. So why is that? Well, let me give you some examples. If we look at achieving all of that, we achieve the right quantity of lights, we achieve the right legislation and accreditation, it's nice and easy to build, we can afford it. Well, here we go. We end up with something like this. This is a car showroom, right? You know, it's not like they're selling anything expensive. Um, and you see here, this is just not a good piece of lighting design. It's an absolute fail because we end up with this tide mark of light around the perimeters. We end up with a ceiling peppered full of spotlights. You know, it's so bad, it's like acne in a ceiling. It's you know, ceiling acne as we refer to it. Lots of spots. It's just really a bland, uninteresting, unappealing space. And we can take a car showroom and we can suddenly achieve all of those things, but we can make it you know, much more interesting. Here, we still have the right quantities of light. We still have the right uh, costs. We still have the right accreditation and legislation being met. 
but here the space feels significantly better. Likewise with a supermarket, you know, here we walk into this space and the eye is immediately drawn to the light. If I'm the lighting manufacturer, great. If I'm the light fixture designer, great. Everyone looks at my light fittings. But in, the, in truth, the eye should really be drawn down. The, you know, the eye should be looking at what's on sale here. And they're not selling light fixtures, they're selling food produce and the merchandise. So well, we really should be drawing the eye down. And that's what we do here in Spa, uh, the Spa supermarket here. It's very much about putting light exactly where it's required. So again, we achieve all of those variables that we need to achieve, but we do it in such a way that the products, the merchandise starts to feel significantly better. We can do the same thing in a, in a commercial space here. You know, in the, in the UK, this achieves the legislation, LG7. Uh, it's nice and safe, it's affordable, it's really horrible and uninspiring to work in. The exact same space uh, after refurbishment looked a little bit like this. In fact, it looked a lot like this because this is it. Um, and this is illuminated with fluorescent batons. It's not LED technology, it's not expensive technology, but it is illuminated in such a way that we achieve contrast and drama and the space feels significantly better. The same can be said for architectural lighting design on the exterior of buildings. Here in Dubai, the Rixos Premium, um, it's an awful piece of lighting because we, you know, the, the, the designer has started to uh, inflict a shape on top of a building. This building is essentially, it's oblong. It's, it's a rectangular box on its end with one fold in the facade, which is this fold just along this front leading edge. And this weird star shape, it sort of just doesn't uh, pay any respect to the architecture of the building. It simply just did, did sort of uses the, ar the architecture of the building as a canvas, which is really great for massaging the lighting designer's ego, but it doesn't celebrate the architecture of the building or the space. And that's, that's wrong. Now, we can take a very similar treatment using lines of light, but use it to describe the form of a building. And then it starts to feel more interesting because the architecture and the lighting are starting to work hand in hand. Um, and obviously, you know, Petronas Towers, it's, it's a very, very famous project by Howard Branston Lighting Design, uh, and it works wonderfully. It's this sort of um, wedding cake uh, of light, this tiering of light that, that totally describes the form of the building. There is, of course, an argument for, you know, in the, in the modern era, that this is also creating a lot of light trespass and a lot of light pollution as well. So maybe it's not as good as it used to be, um, but it certainly works with the architecture of the space. So what is it then, then that, we're, that we're talking about here? Because if, we're if, if in all of those projects, even the bad ones, if in all of them we are achieving all of the variables, the quite right quantity, the right cost, the right buildability, what is that essence then? What is the difference between one being a win and one being a fail? Well really that question and what is the essence of good lighting design is really what is the art of lighting design what what is it that we're applying that makes that feel much more interesting well here's a little equation for you and it's the kind of the holy trinity here it's people it's architecture and it's light and in the middle if we get it right if we take people we take the buildings of the spaces and we introduce light that sense that primary sense sight we actually start to elicit an emotional response we start to emotionally connect with our buildings, our environments, our shops, our hotels, our homes. We become much more emotionally engaged with them. So the art of good lighting design is about emotional connection. And it can be in the most simplest of things, you know, here Loi Kwatong in, in Thailand, this is you know, just a naked flame inside a paper bag being released into the sky. And yet it looks and feels stunningly beautiful. And that is that emotional connection that we have with that firelight, that warm color temperature of light that really engages us. And that can be done with artificial light. You know, here it's, this is a standard 60 watt light bulb, an, an old fashioned incandescent light bulb used in the right way at the right time. It starts to become a thing of beauty. So it is about contextualizing the type of light that we're using in the spaces in order to engage our emotions. And we do this quite well in the arts, you know, here, you know, this is interesting. This is digital revolution from a few years ago, um, Umbrella. Wonderful watching grown adults wander around this art gallery, chasing these intangible beams of light, trying to catch them. Um, really interesting, actually, just you know, and, and, and playful. And, and that's what it should be about, you know, engaging uh, with our spaces. Um, 
here at Cloud by Caitlin Brown. Um, again, you know, hundreds of people turning light bulbs on and off and all, all the, these little strings literally just turn the lights on and off. And this thing becomes an engaging, interactive piece of art. And we're always interacting with, with light, wherever we are and whatever we're doing. If you look around the very room that you are sat in at the moment, don't look at the light fittings, look at the effect of light. If you look at me on my camera, you can see here, some daylight coming in over my shoulder. You can see some artificial light over my other shoulder. You can see this kind of white light across my shirt. You can see a little bit of shadowing and texture across the, the, the ruffles in my shirt. You can probably see some shadows in my, the frowns in my forehead. You see the, the background wall a little bit darker above the light. You see these differences in textures and tones of light on the surface. And that's the thing we don't notice. For fa you know, fans of film, if you've ever seen The Matrix, you know, in the Matrix film, they talk about all these lines of code everywhere. Well, for a lighting designer, it's like that, but in light levels and in, in tones of light. And it's very much about seeing the quality of light on a, on a surface. Um, and you look here, you know, a, a, a typical street scene, just have a think about what the light is doing. We're getting this brightness of light, you know, underneath each light um, fitting, each lamppost. But we see this light sort of radiating off into the background and we see the mist catching it. We see this guy here just sitting by a task light. We see the light coming in, it hits his shoulder. We see some shadows around his neck. We see some shadows around the books. The space starts to look and feel quite three dimensional. So that quality of light is something that we don't pay much attention to, and yet it's all around us. And this is something that the arts do incredibly well. And we're very used to it, you know, when, when we think about artists or, or the creative arts. Um, and they use it to suspend disbelief a lot of the time. So. Here, Cara St. Thomas by Caravaggio. Uh, we have, if you look at the light here, we have light bleeding over the shoulders. We have light hitting the top of the head. There are actually four light sources in this painting. Um, there's one coming over the, um, the shoulder on the left-hand side, one coming over the right-hand side. There's light filling in at the front, and then there's a little bit of light from the top. So it's all cheating. Now, now when Caravaggio first conceived this painting, he didn't draw it and paint it and then think about the lighting. The lighting has to be an in, had to be an inherent part of the composition of the painting. And that goes through all paintings. If we look here, just top right, Philosopher in Meditation by Rembrandt, we see the daylight coming in and, uh, and casting across the philosopher's face. We see here in the bottom right hand corner, the housekeeper stoking the fire and that light bleeding up onto the housekeeper's face. And there's actually a little bit of light cheated in around this helical stair just to give a bit of three dimensionality to that, that staircase. And we look at all of these pictures, all four of these pictures, uh, and we see what the light is doing. Now, often we look at that picture and we think we know it and we don't think about the lighting. So one of the first things I ever did when I studied lighting design, my, my teacher uh, gave us a history of art uh, lesson and said, deconstruct the painting and think about where all of the light sources are. And I defy anybody to do that. Uh, we think of the Mona Lisa. Everybody knows the Mona Lisa painting, probably the most uh, famous painting in all of the world. But how often, do you think about what the light is doing, the shadow under her chin, the shadow in the eye sockets, the shadow around her fingers, what's happening in the background, the tones of light and the textures of light behind her. We really don't think about this very often, we take it for granted, but all of these artists have to think about what that light is doing before they actually start painting, before they lift a brush and, and start to, con to, to produce the painting in, in its original conceptualization, light has to be considered. And this is something that we also take for granted in, in film. Film noir, you know, The Third Man by Carol Reed. If this was a daylit scene or frontlit or floodlit, you wouldn't get this drama. You wouldn't get this beautiful texture across these cobbles. You wouldn't get this light bleeding over his shoulder. You, and, and therefore, you wouldn't get these sort of subtle uh, nuances. You don't know if this is quite a sinister uh, moment. You don't know who this person is, this character is. Uh, you don't know much and it creates a tension. It creates a tension between the film or the cinematography and your eye watching it. And it's all about that emotional response, that emotional tension that gets created. Uh, Blade Runner by Ridley Scott. If you ask any lighting designer like me, you know, uh, their top three uh, illuminated movies or, or movies with lighting in, Blade Runner is always in there, I can assure you. The whole uh, movie is based around uh, this, this idea of, of the future and it's all about light. Uh, I urge you, you know, go watch again after this and, and you, you will see all of these textures and tones uh, of light and lighting. Uh, Aliens by James Cameron, this is the reason I'm a lighting designer. I remember seeing this movie when I was younger and this 
laser kind of came into the spaceship and scanned it for signs of life. And I thought, wow, I don't even know what this is, but it's amazing. I want to do something with this. And um, it just blew me away that you could create that level of tension and drama in a space with, with very, very simple lighting. Um, but even modern movies like La La Land, um, you know, uses lots of sepia tones to make, uh, make it, you know, or give it this sort of very dreamlike quality of, of light. Uh, and of course, sort of more um, spatial artists uh, also do the same thing. Dan Flavin, uh, untitled in 1996, creates this dreamlike quality of light. And it's a rhythm and it's a tension where these don't quite line up and the eye is not quite sure where to focus. It's all about using light and lighting in that space. Um, Oliver Eliasson, Your Uncertain Shadow. Again, I love watching grown adults play with light. I find it a wonderful uh, and really quite amusing uh, thing. And you know, this idea of taking what feels like white light, but breaking it down into its constituent parts and creating this multiple uh, shadowing of, of, of color um, and play of color is, is really quite a beautiful thing. Um, and James Turrell is uh, an artist that's very famous for these sort of um, art installations. He created this thing called a Gansfeld. And the idea of a Gansfeld is that you don't know where the boundaries of a space start or finish. Um, so here you don't really know where the wall meets the floor or the, or, the, or the wall meets the ceiling. We don't know if this sort of pink um, opening at the end of the at the end of the space is that is it solid? Is it uh, is it an opening? Uh, what what is it? Why where is that light coming from? So we create this tension because we we're playing with people's perception and connection and composition of the space. So it's this wonderful um, substance that light is, you know, it's an intangible substance that light is that allows us to do this and play with people's perceptions um, of, of their given space. Um, people like Cinemod Studio do this very well as well, you know, it's interactive uh, art. And Cinemod took that one step further because they then um, worked with a, um, a frozen yogurt company called Snog. And Snog, in all of their stores, use light to create an Instagram moment, this sort of beautiful piece of art that's in the space that actually really starts to define the architecture of the space and what they're very cleverly doing is blurring the boundaries between art light and architecture so we really start to create an interesting relationship between those three elements and it's something we've done before you know in Abu Dhabi with um, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company or Corporation we created these coffers of light on this sort of oil black ceiling to create a really interesting um, a ge geological feature um, or, or, or homage to a, a geological feature. And that can also be done you know, in residential projects as well. Here it's, it's working with the artist to illuminate this chandelier to create these textures of light uh, on the floor. And it is all about illuminating you know, the space and the facade and playing with people's perception. Here's an interesting project actually. There's no light on the floor. It's very, very limited amounts of light. It's all about lighting the vertical surfaces. So it creates a visually clutter-free space, but it plays with people's perception because it illuminates the boundaries. Our peripheral vision left to right is significantly wider than it is up and down. So when we light vertical surfaces, we start to read the space much better because our peripheral vision, if I look forwards now, I can barely see the floor below me, but I can see the walls left and right of me. So the art of light, it's about blurring the boundaries between lighting and architecture in order, or the, the art of good lighting design, I should say, is about blurring the boundaries between light and architecture uh, in order to create that emotional response. Some branding agencies do it incredibly well. You know, brand, as, as far as brands go, uh, Nike create wonderful kind of um, environments where you go in and you understand the brand. There's nothing, if you look at this image, where is the product? There's almost no product. You've got three, three or four um, flyknit trainers in the middle of the space and nothing else. But it's all about connecting with the Nike brand. Um, Selfridges, uh, we've done very similar things. We've, in the lingerie department, we've created uh, these sort of Japanese style quality of light through shoji screens, through these large barrel boxes to create a very soft quality of light that feels very feminine uh, and is very flattering to really to enable you know, ladies to uh, ideally spend more money. So we're working with the branding here to ultimately uh, enhance expenditure in store. So what is the role of the lighting designer in all of this? Now, 
by lighting designer, I really do mean anyone that's specifying lighting. So if there's anyone here that's a, an architect or an interior designer, you are as equally as important as a lighting designer. Uh, to be honest with you, even my mum or my grandmother, you know, if they choose a light fitting and they deliberately uh, choose to put it somewhere in a space, then they are a lighting designer because they are deliberately choosing the way that the light is interacting with whatever surface. So it's really important to, to sort of underline that and then start to think about what the variables are then that we have to play with as lighting designers, as lighting selectors. So the first thing to say then as lighting designers, we are really surface designers. Take this space here. This is a commercial headquarters building that we lit a few years ago. When the architect originally came to us, this ceiling was white. So it was very low contrast. It was you know, lighting and, and white ceiling, white soffit. It meant that, that it would have felt very sort of light and bright and the eye would have been taken up. And they said they wanted it to feel more intimate. How, what do we do? How do we add more light? How do we create more feature? And I said, well, actually, the best thing you can do is paint the ceiling black because then it creates this tension between the light and the dark. And then we draw all of the eye down with this lighting that sits underneath the seating. We can play with different textures on those surfaces. So again, it's about lighting designer, lighting selector, working with the surface, um, the surfaces and ideally informing the architect or the interior designer and advising whether that should be a specular surface, a rough surface, a, a honed surface so that we can really play with the way that lighting is, is hitting them and creating um, uh, you know, that, that illuminated effect. Here we have red light onto a red wall. It's Manchester United. The home kit is red. This is as you walk into their store. You can imagine if I was a Manchester City fan or a Chelsea fan, for those that know the football, um, or the, the British football, uh, if I was wearing a blue shirt and I walked into here, my blue shirt would look muddy. It would look not very nice at all. But if I was wearing my red Manchester United uh, shirt, it would pop and look absolutely amazing. So this is red onto red so that, that it works incredibly well. Um, it is our job as lighting designers to focus attention on the surfaces or the materiality or, or the objects that we want to. So take Liberties, for example. This is one of the, the foremost department stores in central London. You can go in here and you can buy a dress for uh i don't know a thousand dollars you know it's expensive expensive clothing um here the focus should be on the product and yet it's not if we look we see these spots of light on the floor you know missing the mannequins things look in shadow they look uninteresting we look here again you know spots of light this mannequin is completely unilluminated you can barely really tell the detail or see the detail in that that fashion garment um, the lighting is completely missing the point Whereas we look at people like Superdry or Hollister and Abercrombie, they're very much about focusing exactly on the merchandise and letting the floor die off completely. Uh, it's something in Selfridges which is a game, we worked with them a few years ago. And uh, this is interesting. It doesn't have to be as dark or as moody as, as Superdry or Hollister or Abercrombie. We can still maintain some level of contrast, but if we focus the light on the merchandise, we draw the eye to the merchandise. And hey, if I'm a retailer and I want to sell handbags, then I, I absolutely would like as many people looking at those handbags as possible rather than looking at the floor. So it's all about focusing light exactly where it's required. It is about enhancing the brand and creating a brand identity, particularly in, in the retail environment, but all, it, we're seeing it more and more in hospitality. We're seeing it more and more in hotels. We're seeing it more and more in the commercial uh, corporate world as well. But think about Apple. Apple are, you know, we all have, I have an iPhone. Most people have an iPhone. It's intuitive to use. My five-year-old daughter can use an iPhone. Um, they want the space to feel natural and inviting because their brand philosophy is we are accessible to all. So what have they done? Well, they've created this incredibly diffuse space that's very, very easy to navigate. They've deliberately underlined their brand and then they've introduced these trees to the space so that it feels like a natural place to be. You know, they are, they are absolutely uh, using kind of natural tones and natural um, cues to, to trick you into, into thinking this brand really is an easy to use, easily accessible brand. Really clever the way that they design their stores. Equally in corporate spaces, you know, here's one that we uh, introduced a, um, a dynamic. This is a, a, it's a dynamic wall. It's, a, it's an art installation. As you walk out of the lift, this wall comes to life and it, it, it sort of scrolls and it, it follows you around. And it's uh, absolutely in keeping with the, the barcode brand of the insurance firm. 
Um, Hakkasan Yuacha um, is also another brand. You know, they, they are synonymous with the color blue. The reason they use this blue tone is to, because if we use contrast, uh, if we use blue in the background and we use warm lights onto our food, we can actually make the food look incredibly golden and warm and welcoming because we are comparing it with a contrasting color. So this blue has become synonymous with the Hakkasan group. Um, so they are subtly branding their space through, through the, this blue color. Uh, it is our job to enhance finishes. You know, there's some amazing technology out there these days. Um, we talk about CRI, that's color rendering index. Um, or more importantly now, we talk about TM70 or 80 or 90. Um, it's, it's very much about rendering color properly. So if we use high quality products, if we don't go to China and buy cheap products, then we can make our, bra our, our items. Now, like, this could be a beautiful rug that we've, we've bought somewhere, you know, that's uh, bought from somewhere in the Himalayas or something. You know, it could be a beautiful finish on the wall. It could be, you know, a, a lovely fashion uh, item. It could be makeup. It could be, you know, whatever the pigmentation is, we want to render that coloring as well as we possibly can, which means using high quality product in order to be able to do that. Now, more often than we not, more often than not, we see value engineering happening. We see contractors, you know, finding a product that looks a little bit like the one that got specified. And then we end up with something like this for the quality of light, the intangible thing that we're going to see, you know, all the time, the intangible thing that's going to interact with all those lovely expensive finishes. And then we, we dilute it because we're using a cheaper product. So it's really important that we do our very best to render things as, as well as we possibly can. Um, here in the UK, we find this all the time because ladies here in the UK like to wear a lot of makeup and they like to look quite tan, so they wear a lot of foundation. And we find often that they will go and get foundation color matched in a department store, and then they'll go home and they'll look a completely different color. Um, and that's often to do with poor color rendering. So we worked uh, with the Estee Lauder group a few years ago to develop a particular LED chip specifically for enhancing skin tone so that we can make ladies or gents, if you're trying on makeup, we can make them uh, look as good as possible. We've also done this in places like Leak Street. This is the only place in the UK, in London, that it is legal to, um, to, to graffiti. Um, and here, you know, we're using the same quality of light as there is in the National Portrait Galleries. So this is stunning quality of light. And the, order, the, the reason that we did this was, was that we wanted to elevate this graffiti to the status of art. Whether you like it or not is, is up for grabs, but we elevated this to the status of art and really wanted those colors to pop so that it feels engaging and it feels really sort of in, interesting and exciting. Of course, we want to use color in a space. Um, I would always sort of counsel against using lots and lots of color. I mean, in, in Dubai, we see it. In Las Vegas, we see it. Lots and lots of, co of color and it becomes a real cacophony to the point where everybody is competing with each other. And sometimes less is more. So using the right light in the right way you know, is important. So sometimes there is um, an opportunity for colored light, but other times uh, perhaps we don't want to do that. So it's worth looking at. Um, we do want to create permeability. Now this is an interesting thing. Um, the eye is always drawn to the brightest point in a space. So if I'm standing outside a restaurant or a bar or a shop and it's a bright sunny day and we look in, often the store looks closed. It looks unwelcoming and uninviting. For those of you that know Dubai, City Walk in particular, um, suffers from this. You stand outside the stores, you, it looks too dark uh, inside. The reason for that is because the light levels are not balanced with the daylight. At night, it comes to life because it's gone dark, the, the sun has gone, and we can see inside. So one of the things we have to think about is how we create permeability. Well, if the eye is always drawn to the brightest point in the space, then we want to draw the eye through the space and we want to create brighter levels of light indoors. So what we do is we start to play with a foreground, a midground, and a background, and we start to create depth and we illuminate the foreground, midground, and background differently. So think of DK and Y here on Bond Street. Here we illuminated the front of the store in order to keep, you know, to grab people's attention and pass us by. But then we illuminated the middle of the store about 20% brighter. And then the back of the store, we then illuminated about a further 20% brighter. So the eye gets drawn all the way through that space and we create a nice permeable space during the day. And then at night when the sun sets, if we have sun in the UK, when the sun sets, then the lights dim down a little bit as well so that we retain that balance and that, that contrast. And it's something we can do in, you know, in many different ways. Here in Harrods, we created this Oculus 
at the end of the corridor that creates a full stop. So again, we want this corridor to feel permeable. So we create a level of brightness at the end of the corridor. We draw the eye through the space. Uh, and here in Yungo in, in China, we illuminated the perimeter of the space uh, in order to define the edges, define the boundaries and draw the eye through to create permeability. And if we can't do that, then there are other ways of doing it through things like feature lighting, for example. Um, rhythm is also really important as well. Rhythm is all about consistent spacing of brightness. That's all it is. So whether that's something as simple as a bollard and we create them at a, a nice sort of simple spacing, it draws the eye along, it helps create permeability through rhythmic design. Contrast and drama. Now this is an interesting one. You know, typically speaking, the higher the contrast, the more luxurious something feels, whether that's a restaurant, a shop, uh, or a house or a home. Lots of contrast feels luxurious. Low contrast generally equates to less luxury. So we can use this, you know, this is, this is a really interesting space here because the side on the left feels a little bit more luxurious than the side on the right. It's identical levels of light, identical uniformity. This is all about contrast. This is about that black ceiling against that white ceiling. That's all it is. Otherwise, it's pretty much identical levels of light. Um, so we see this here in the, you know, a low contrast store. It feels a little bit cheaper, a little bit more high street. But we see this in a high contrast store. This is Victoria Beckham in London. You know, it's a mirrored ceiling. So we have a very dark ceiling because it's reflecting that dark floor, which means it's the walls that are, that are bright. It means the, the merchandise pops. Uh, there is a reason for this. It's typically speaking in luxurious retail spaces. They don't re-merchandise ever so often. They might change the goods uh, once a season, maybe twice a season. In low, um, kind of low-end stores like H&M or Primark, if you know those brands, they typically change their SKUs, their, their product lines weekly, and they often don't have time to focus. So they want very uniform levels of light. Um, here, and this is a wine store here in the UK, you know, this is all about LED lighting onto the labels, onto the wine bottles, so the wine bottles pop. But contrast, high contrast, it means it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be dark. And this is that Abercrombie Hollister thing that I was mentioning before, where you know, if I walk into an Abercrombie store, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s, it's too dark for me. I don't know what I'm, I can't see what I'm buying anymore, so I have to go and take it to the window. Um, but then they don't want me buying their stuff. I'm too old and uncool these days. Um, but that's, you know, at Hollister Abercrombie have around a 10 or 15 to 1 contrast ratio. So we can maintain contrast ratios, but just take everything up. So we can hear this is a contrast ratio of around five to one, but the levels are much lighter and brighter. So we still maintain the focus on, on merchandise and it still feels pretty welcoming. Now I've mentioned vertical illumination a few times here. Here's some good examples of how that works. Horizontal illumination, we light the floor. For those of you that know lighting codes, we talk about lux, we'll often talk about how much light there is on the floor or on the desk or on the task surface. Well, that's great. But if all we're lighting is the table, we forget about those, those things in it called people. And we forget how they're interacting and what they're seeing. And if we like the vertical surfaces, as I said earlier on, our peripheral vision is much wider. We start to navigate the space much better. Now this means you can have a lot less light on that surface or that task plane. So this is what I meant before, where there's always a tension between quality of light and required quantity of light. And it takes a good lighting designer to be able to navigate those rules and regulations. And we see here at Victoria Beckham, almost no light on the floor, lots of light on the wall and on the merchandise. And the store is, is more navigable. navigable. Uh, again, for KPMG here, uh, this is all about um, obviating the need for orientation. So taking away signage, there's no signage required. I walk into this space and my eye is always drawn to the brightest point. And here we've made that brightest point, the vertical surfaces, I know immediately where I have to go. I know immediately where the reception desk is. So I am drawn to it without the need for a, a, a lot of signage. So it's very simple use of lighting to orientate people around the space. Go back to our car showroom, which I showed you earlier on. Horizontal illumination, terrible vertical illumination. It doesn't feel luxurious. It doesn't feel interesting. It doesn't feel particularly easy to navigate either. Um, 
Whereas we take an exterior space and we light the walls again, it feels very easy to navigate, it feels very interesting, no light on the floor. The same could be said here in this residential space. It's all about lighting the walls so that we define the boundaries of the space. Um, we have a, uh, this sort of greater opportunity to integrate lighting these days as well with the use of LED technology. Um, we're able to integrate lighting better because LED has become miniaturized. So good lighting design doesn't have to be expensive anymore. This is actually for a relatively low end residential development in the UK in London here. Very simple lighting techniques. You know, you've got nice finishes, a painted coffer here, a painted uh, a metallic finish, lighting onto it so it feels a bit specular and shiny. Um, and it's all about playing with those surfaces, but actually it's a very inexpensive fit out. Um, equally, you know, beautiful miniature little coves here in this bathroom space. Um, you know, LED integrated. Ten years ago, we couldn't do this because we didn't have the technology. So understanding the, that miniaturization of LED technology and uh, applying that has really allowed us to create much more interesting forms and it becomes more, more artistic, more creative, more interesting. We're also able to reduce energy now through the use of, um, of LED technology. This is a very low end uh, fashion retailer here in the UK. I mean, they really cheap. They came to us and said, this is our store. And we think we've got, uh, we, want, we, need to, we think we're using too much energy. We need to save energy. And we said, well, it's so dark in here anyway. I have no clue how we can take lights out and save your energy because we'll end up with even less light. And we nearly turned the project down, but I like a challenge. So we said, okay, well, well, we'll try it. And we did an awful lot of research and work. And we, you know, this is what their store looked like, really uninviting, very dark. Um, but you can see there's sort of minimal lighting to the perimeters. I mean, you see here on that left-hand image, there's almost zero lighting around, around the, the edges of the space. And we said, okay, well, maybe if we apply light on, on, on different surfaces, we might be able to save a bit of money. So we see here on the right-hand side was the existing scheme with lots of down lights. On the left hand side, we proposed a lighting solution that was based on linear LED sources. It's a, it's a high volume retailer, they're very low end, they turn their product around almost weekly. So they're really not bothered about it feeling luxurious. So we said, okay, maybe we can get a relatively good level of uniformity with linear lines of light. Uh, they were getting around uh, four to 600 lux. And we actually managed to increase the levels of lights on this project, which was quite interesting. Um, and actually, we said to them, we think we can probably save you 41% energy, you know, which is a huge saving. They wanted 20%. And in the end, we said, no, we think we can get double what you want as an energy saving. And across 2,000 stores, you can imagine, you're saving 40% energy. That's a huge saving on the electricity bill. Um, so if we, could, if we could achieve that, then, then everybody wins. And we did manage to do it. And the store started off looking like this. It ended up looking like this. It's never going to win any awards for a beautiful piece of design, but as a piece of engineering, it's very successful because we like the perimeter, we like the verticals. It's got good uniform lighting across the space. The product, as you can see, it's very densely uh, merchandised. The product feels uh, much lighter and brighter. And we even metered this. We actually put an electricity meter in and we were able to monitor the energy consumption beforehand and the energy consumption afterwards. And we actually saw a 40% reduction. So we got what we thought we were going to get, which is a phenomenal energy reduction. Um, one of the other things we need to do as lighting designers, you know, rather than thinking about single light sources, I'm putting down lights in a room, I'm putting spotlights somewhere. It, you need to think about layering lights, creating you know, different layers. In retail, we often have five layers of lights in residential context, we often have three. Those layers are ambient lighting. So that's the stuff we see by. Uh, we have accent lighting, which is all about creating pockets of light that punch through that ambient lighting. So it's accent punches through that. So it's like a, like a musical score where we have a background level of, of, of rhythm and then we punch through it with staccatos. The other layers of light, then we then introduce a feature lighting, which might be focal points. And then in a retail context, we also have signage and wayfinding and we also have digital screens as well. Um, and we need to really think about the quality of light that those digital screens give to the space because it's often not very nice. So here you can see in this residential project, we have feature lighting coming from our chandelier. We have ambient lighting coming from the coffer. And then we have a little bit of accent lighting just out of shot, just above here, which is punching down onto that seat. 
So we create different layers of light and we blend those layers of light through the use of lighted controls to create a beautiful composition. It is like creating music. You know, we have our instruments, we lay them down on a, an eight track or a four track, and then we just balance them, you know, um, and it's, you know, to create that musical composition. We do exactly the same with light, but it becomes a visual composition. Here in Bloomingdale's Q8, we did exactly the same thing. We have ambient lighting coming from the ceiling, accent lighting coming from those spotlights. We have digital media screens uh, as well. And then we probably have some feature lighting somewhere else. And it's all about creating, you know, a relatively balanced composition of light. So composition is, is, is really important. Here, we compose this space. This is a bar in, uh, here in London. You see on the left-hand side, we have lighting under the bar counter. Well, that's deliberately at about the same height as the lighting on the right-hand side behind that bonquette. We have the feature pendants on the left-hand side, deliberately on, uh, balancing with the pendants on the right-hand side. We have spotlights coming from above onto the horizontal surfaces to illuminate those tables. So we're creating these tram lines that converge at the back of the space. It creates rhythm, it creates permeability, it draws the eye through the space whilst illuminating those surfaces. So that composition is all about drawing people in because the owner of this, this bar and restaurant had problems in the summer where people were walking past and they didn't know they were open. So we created this composition that draws the eye through the space um, and it's all about balancing the left-hand side with the right-hand side. Here in this restaurant, we do exactly the same thing here. We have illuminated uh, lighting with actually within the table that sits up with, um, uh, underneath this feature chandelier that's above. And then that's balanced with this lighting uh, on the back wall. It's all about creating this feeling of intimacy. So we can compress and decompress a space through the use of light as well. Um, you know, this is a, a computer rendering, but you see how each of those four images shows the same space looking and feeling very different. And we emotionally react to those spaces differently because of what light is doing. Now think of this as a, say a meeting room or a dining room. Here, this is a 2.25 meter high ceiling. So it's very low ceiling height, really low. And in order to make this space look and feel uh, lighter and brighter, we ended up introducing illuminated panels plus lighting around this, this perimeter edge as well. So I said earlier on, the, the eye is always drawn to the brightest point in a space. If I want to decompress the space, I want all of the light above me. So my eye is drawn up and the space feels more voluminous. It feels larger and brighter and, and more inviting. Whereas if I want the space to feel more intimate, well, then I want to draw the eye down. So here we deliberately have pendants that are solid, which means they're punching all of the light downwards onto the table. We deliberately have a white table and a dark ceiling. So the darkness is above us, the lightness is below us. The eye is drawn down and it feels more intimate. Go back, we have a darker table and a lighter ceiling. The eye is drawn up, we decompress the space. We have a lighter surface below the eye, darker surfaces above the eye, it feels more intimate. Very simple tricks and tips that we can, we can use to, to create a different feeling, a different emotional connection with their space. And this could be a residential space, it could be a hotel, it could be a restaurant. The same principles apply. We obviously have the opportunity to introduce dynamic lighting wherever possible. Uh, you know, we can use that in, in shopping malls, for example, to draw the eye through and, and have lights that color change um, to make a space feel more permeable. We can use dynamic lighting in, um, you know, sort of art compositions as well to, to make the space feel uh, interesting and, and come alive. These days with the, the advent of selfies, you know, everyone's on Instagram, I am. Um, everybody wants a, a good selfie. So we stand in a fitting room and we want to take a picture. Well, in which case we need really good vertical illumination onto the face in order to um, you know, make the, the space feel good or make you look good in your uh, selfie. But we might then want to dim the lights up as well or down so that you can take a, comp uh, a picture of you dressed in whatever you're wearing in a nightclub or in a, in a daytime or by the swimming pool. So you can see the difference of what your clothes are going to look like according to the time of the day. So there's a, a really important place for dynamic lighting. Health and well-being is something that we're seeing more of as well in, in lighting design. Um, we're seeing, a, you know, we, we found out a few years ago that, um, that blue light actually um, interacts with a, a third receptor. So we were taught at school that, you know, our eye sees uh, coloured light um, during the day and then and grey light at, or, or sorry, um, uh, singular light, uh, you know, um, lost my train of thought now, um, singular light in the evenings. Um, 
so that we see monochromatic light um, in the evenings. Um, well, actually, there's a third receptor which uh, reacts to blue light and that regulates melatonin and serotonin production. So now if I want somebody in my office to feel more alert, say after lunch, when they're feeling a little bit sleepy, now I can introduce a little bit more blue light to make them feel more alert. Or I can start to use warmer tones of light to make people feel less jet lagged. So for example, here, this is the Blue Lagoon Hotel in Iceland. Here, when if I fly in and I feel a bit tired, I wanna to go to bed, I can have complete blackout. Now, when I go to bed, I go to bed under a very warm quality of light. There's almost no blue light in there. So I'm not triggering my melatonin and serotonin production. Um, through the warm light, uh, I go to sleep, the lights dim down. When my alarm goes off, what actually happens, I set my alarm for 7 a.m. Half an hour before my alarm goes off, the lights start to dim up. So as my alarm goes off, I'm very slowly already coming out of my sleep and I'm not suddenly wrenched out of my, or wrenched out of my sleep. Um, I don't know if you're like I am, but I, I get grumpy in the morning if I get woken up. Um, so I'm not rudely awoken. I'm very gently woken up. The curtains electronically open and there I am exposed to daylight. So it becomes a much more natural feeling of waking up because let's remember when we were cave dwellers, we went to bed by firelight when it was dark and we woke up to dawn. So this is a recreating of dawn and, and, and sunset um, basically but we go to bed with warm light and we wake up with much cooler color temperature, much uh, more blue light in, that, um, in those features in order to trigger melatonin and serotonin production. Uh, so these are the kind of things we see with cortisol um, uh, as well. And we see you know, these, these uh, hormones being produced or decreasing throughout the day. So uh, that's a lot from me. It's a bit of a canter through. I mean, the things to finish up by saying really is you know, the art of lighting design. The art of good lighting design is, is the art of understanding people and their emotional response um, to a space. So we, you know, as, as, as specifiers, we have the power uh, to, to have that over people. You know, we can, we can affect people without them knowing. We get to be the unsung hero. We get to take a space and use, you know, an average space and use good, beautiful lighting and elevate that average space to something of, of beauty and, 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 and gorgeousness. Whereas we can take a beautiful space and light it badly and, uh, and we can make a bit of a dog's dinner of it. So um, ideally, uh, we would like to you know, make spaces as interesting as possible. So we have that power and now hopefully we have that knowledge um, because if we do do it well, then we can create these really wonderful, beautiful, emotionally responsive spaces. So lighting design is easy. Anybody can do that. They can choose a light fitting, they can choose a light source, they can decide where they're putting it in a space. Um, the art of lighting design is more difficult because lighting is a language, right? It's a language used to facilitate communication between a person and their environments. That's all it is. It's simple. Okay. It is simply, uh, you know, a facilitator um, of emotional response. Um, the art of lighting design, getting it right is subtle and it is complex um, and it needs careful consideration and it needs thinking about like those artists right at the beginning of a project um that's that's kind of it from me i shall i can hand back to you, mohammed if you're if you're there yes i'm here um i already find everyone if they have questions to share it uh thank you a lot for the presentation it's, uh, it was very informative actually you say actually thank you i'm good I'm <laughs> <laughs> no no it's, what were you it's really no 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 it's, no, no, it's actually really well yeah, thank you. Uh, Certainly, uh, if, there are any, if there are any questions, I'd be delighted to take them. Um, yes, uh, we, yeah, we were waiting to, to, to have a couple of questions, so yeah. we can wrap. Uh, uh, I think we can take one um, question uh, with uh, Mr. Abdel Fattah, then we will go back to the written questions. I did see somebody raise a hand somewhere. Yeah, yes, 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 that was me. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, I, I'm doing my, my daily uh, routine walk, but I had to stop because I could not miss an opportunity to interact with such a wonderful session, one of the most interesting sessions I heard uh, lately. So I thank you. you. You were so generous. You were so enriching yani, to us. I'm an architect and I'm sure many of uh, yani, similar practitioners like me or young uh, uh, designers and so 
have loved this because really it was but simply but so richly. Uh, um, beyond this, and I want to uh, just, if you, if you may allow me, I have a few points that I would like you to kind of mm. further enrich us on uh, and maybe uh, a light shed on. Um, uh, one of them, uh, you, you mentioned uh, when it came to economical kind of uh, layer of having uh, uh, an a light uh, design consultant, but like probably a low income residential or a mid mm. uh, income residential or so. When we say that, uh, one of the very first question we get always uh, kind of faced with and hit by uh, as, as a, a design architect, so how much is your fees and so before we, we even, even know the project. So to get this kind of more digested by people, by, by end user, and we always believe I mean, uh, I'm one of the guys who, who worked many uh, hospitality projects, and I know that um, lighting consultant is uh, not uh, a cosmetic, it's a must for a project like this to really uh, to complement uh, beyond. And we always explain to many of our clients that beyond our architectural surfaces and interior design surfaces, there is a specialty lighting consultant who could really complement and make the end product really so appreciated. Mm -hmm. So coming to that, I would like to, to kind of hear from you on one point on how, how competitive we can get lighting consultant to, to kind of uh, work with us on, on larger uh, uh, range of projects. And, and uh, you, since you mentioned residential and we have uh, people who might be uh, so many of them who might really engage with residential. So if you can do, can we work with you, let's say, per se, in a project like residential for individuals uh, uh, hiring, uh, you know, consultant like, like you? This is number one. Number two, uh, we in, in, our, in our region, and you worked in, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and I'm sure in Saudi, you know how, how abundant we have of natural uh, lighting. And, and natural sun, and we have with the playing with with the natural lighting, uh, ampel uh, with the shadow and shade. Uh, we can do a great also lighting effect, and we can do a great uh, energy saving uh, for the whole day. I mean, then when it comes to nighttime, probably evening, we want to see how smart is the lighting also. Um, but uh, I w I have yeah, you have. I would love if you could also. Uh, light sh shed on, on, on this item, how you could do that. Last but not least, um, we always say in the lighting, uh, the mix uh, uh, between uh, white and warm, you know, uh, cool and warm, give a good uh, kind of beautiful uh, kind of uh, natural atmosphere within the space. Uh, if you can uh, more uh, clarify on this. And uh, there is also a common uh, fault that many people here uh, in residential um, by using uh, a blue or, or a daylight uh, fluorescent and so versus the warm uh, mm. light. So if you can, please kind of okay. educate us more on this. <laughs> Sorry for having long, no, long okay. session question, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm interested myself uh, okay. being uh, more than 30 years practitioner. I'm sure yeah. many young guys would love to hear your answers too. Okay, I'm going to try and answer that. And if I miss anything, please let me know. Okay, there's a lot there in to, to unpack. So, I'm all ears. <laughs> okay, Go so how to, how to get a lighting designer in, involved in a project. Funny enough, I've just written a piece for a magazine here in the UK, which we will, we will be posting on our blog um, probably in the next 48 hours. Um, and it's worth having a read because I think it's understanding that you know, lighting is not just light. Lighting is about emotional connection. Lighting is a, you know, a good lighting designer actually will probably save you money. You might pay for a fee and it might be you know, an expensive fee, but in the long run, you will probably save money on supply. There's no such thing as a free, free lunch, right? And we see sure. so many people, you know, they offer lighting for free because they are a supplier or a manufacturer. And the thing is, when that happens, you're probably paying more money for the light fixture. You're probably using more light fixtures than you actually need. So a good lighting designer, not just us, there are other ones out there as well, but a good lighting designer will you know, be able to articulate the value that they bring to the, to the project. And as, as I say, it's about that emotional response. It is about saving money because they know the marketplace. And a questionable uh, statement, by all means. 
some projects you know have very very low budgets um where that is the case uh, we in uh in the in the middle east we actually have two businesses we have a company called studio n um as well which is our sort of little sister company and they work specifically on um small low budget residential and hospitality projects and they are geared up specifically to do that because you know by definition of those projects they don't have complicated architectural detailing you know because they can't afford them anyway so um so studio only work on those projects the nullity projects are geared up towards more complex projects but um i think if we can articulate the value that we bring it is more than just choosing light fittings and sticking the right level of light in the space then i think it becomes an easier sell but it is ultimately about educating architect and ideally the client so the client understands the value now it's really hard because lighting is intangible we don't see light we see the surface that light interacts with so you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a flooring finish or a beautiful surface and light it badly because we don't understand that the only reason that that beautiful granite that i've that i've flown in from italy or that marble i've got from italy you know that's costing thousands of dollars per square meter um if you don't understand that you're only seeing that look beautiful because it's a beautiful light that's hitting that surface bouncing off of that surface into our eye so if we get that right then we make that beautiful quality of materiality look great so it's a hard sell because light is intangible so you're saying to a client this isn't about a chandelier this isn't about the tangible product it's about the intangible substance the, the you know that the, the hardware is giving off you know, think of it as software and hardware you know the light fitting is the hardware the, the the light that it gives off is the software and we really have to think about the quality of that so it's a hard sell but you know a good lighting designer i hope uh, would certainly help you as the architect um to to kind of help the client ultimately understand that and a, and a good lighting designer should also be challenging you as the designer anyway we should be saying to you, you know, do you really need a wall there? Should that be white? Can it be black? Should we change this finish? It's a two-way dialogue. It's a collaboration. Um, as I say, there is a blog post. If you check our, our website in the next 48 hours, there is a whole you know, thousand word blog that is going to be posted um, up there anyway. So we will get that posted as quickly as possible for you. Please go, go check it out. Um, how to compete with daylight. Well, you don't. I mean, you can't compete with daylight. It's very difficult, uh, particularly in the Middle East where you have really strong levels of sunlight. But you can balance those contrast ratios. You can reduce the contrast ratios, again, by putting the right vertical light in the right place at the right time in the right way. Um, so that, that, that certainly can be done. But again, it needs careful understanding. It needs contextualization. Often we need to think about transition spaces because the eye, you know, if you're coming out of the car and walking into a building in the middle of a you know, daytime in Riyadh, the eye will be adapted for very bright levels of light, which means the pupil will be very, very small because we want to minimize uh, the daylight getting in. Uh, and, probably I, I did not uh, yeah, I mean to, to kind of compete rather than how a lighting consultant would kind of help the architect to use the the available uh, abundant natural abundant, light. Yeah, okay, okay. Into, yeah. Into, okay, well, the same yes. thing applies. What, what is your role as a lighting consultant? Yeah. Into this is energy saving, but this is capturing uh, a source that is cheaply available and yeah. could add a lot of beauty. I, I tweeted uh, on a project I did uh, recently on how natural light really made so beautiful in the interior. Then I left another layer at night. So that's where I want to see okay, how you as a lighting consultant. Well, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that is about understanding the floor plate depths. It's understanding about the penetration of daylight. It's understanding the, the use of the space. There are lots of questions that you have to ask in order to understand the use of daylight. You know, because you also have issues with heat gain. Too much daylight, you end up with too much heat. You end up with too much, you're having to get an awful lot of cooling right. into the space. So it becomes a two-way conversation about fenestration. It becomes... You know, there are technologies out there that capture daylight. It's not great. You know, light pipe, for example, um, fiber optics that try, you know, we, we've worked with that to try and funnel light into a building. It's not particularly efficient. Ideally, we have light wells. It's about working with you really to understand penetrations in slabs and in facades to really think about where light is coming from. One of the other challenges, as I was saying, though, is that when we're outside, the pupil is contracted, restricted to, to not damage the eye. So our pupil contracts, but then when we walk into the space out of daylight, 
suddenly it feels very gloomy because we're not getting enough artificial light into the space, into the eye. So we need to actually, and, and particularly prevalent in, in the Middle East, we need to create larger, slower paced transition spaces, which allow us to enter a building at, I don't know, say 1500 lux, and then step the light levels down as we enter, as we get into the building. It takes the eye about 30 seconds to adapt when we go from outside to in. So if we've got high contrast, we need a transition space. So again, we need to work with you to think about the, the, the style and the, the, the pace and the length and the, the type of transition space that is. And I'm sure we've got right. other questions. So just to- Yeah, I, 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 I will comment and I say, I probably will have a personal sessions. We have yeah. a lot as architect to share where we can really uh, share many thoughts between architectural light and consultant, between planes, between sure. shades and orientation and do really a great compliment work on, yeah. on daylight. Okay. Thank you so much. My I pleasure. And then this. your last point was Thank about you. warm and cool. The only thing I'll say on that, yes. you know, culturally, it's a psychological thing actually, but you know, in the Middle East, we, we often like a lot of cool, like you know, colder color temperatures. And that tends to be because it's contrasting against what we would deem to be the heat of the sun. You know, we see the sun, we yeah. see it as warm, it feels warm. So you can kind of psychologically trick people into you know, feeling like a space is colder than it is by using cold light or warm, cooler color temperatures. So there is always that interplay of cool and warm color temperature lighting. But if we want a space to feel intimate at night, for example, we're used to firelight. You know, if we want something to feel romantic um, or intimate, then often we want very warm lighting. So one of the great things about LED technology these days is we get what's called warm to dim or cool to dim lighting. So we can change the color temperature. We can shift the color temperature from daytime to nighttime. And then even as we dim the light levels down and down and down, it starts to warm up again and looks and feels warmer. So we, again, it's about playing with people's perception of light. And this is my, my really the crux of all of this. The art of good lighting design is understanding people's emotional response to the, their own perception of what is going on um, around them. And, and that's really, so, you know, if, you, if anybody here wants to be a lighting designer, the wonderful thing about the job of the lighting designer is you're sort of part creative, part scientist, part psychologist, part sociologist, mm. um, you know, part mathematician. Um, you know, it's this sort of multifaceted, wonderful career. I love it. You know, it's why, why I live and breathe what I do because it's, it's all of these disciplines uh, wrapped up in, in, in one role. Um, so I recommend that if anybody's thinking about becoming a lighting designer. Um, <laughs> I think I hope I've answered your questions. I I, I won't say you, you did you did so well. Thank you, and I'll be in touch with you after uh, after the session. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Arkin. I enjoyed it all thank the way. You thank you. Thank you. Okay, but, uh, this point regarding all these careers or type of profession that the lighting designer is doing is one of the barriers that the interior designers are always facing. They think that okay, or let's say we believe that we will design something really fabulous, then we will start having doubts about lighting design. And uh, with the lake of, let's say, experience in lighting design as a geo designer, we start having this question. We have a lot, plenty of questions actually about this point. So I'm combining them and, and what is the best way for an interior designer, or let's say anyone who's designing an interior space, regardless the configuration of, of function, office, retail, mixed use, whatever, what is the best source or best practice to, to at least do a proper lighting design? Is it directly to go to a lighting designer or there are some basics that we have to follow for let's say medium range projects? Yeah. Well, I hope that um, some of what I have sort of spoken through today mm. gets people thinking about some of the basics. Um, the lighting design world is terrible when it comes to education. I have to be honest with you. Um, we are, we're not good as an industry um, at getting a lot of, sort of educational information out there. But so it is about digging around to understand, you know, um, you, you sort of have to be quite proactive um, as a, an interior designer and architect. You really have to go and, and look, deliberately look for that information yeah. um, and do the research. Yeah. There are some lovely lighting design courses out there. There's one in Vismar that's a remote learning course, for example. I think um, the ILP or the ILE were, were looking at setting up a course in the Middle East as well. Um, but generally speaking, lighting education is not good. When we talk to interior designers or architects, you're lucky if you get a small module on the university course that talks about light. You're lucky. You know, I think it's, it's a real shame there is such poor training. Um, 
So it is about digging around. I mean, by all means, please have a look at our blog. You'll find that there are there's lots of information on our blog, um, which will point you in the right direction. There are lots of very good books. If, you, if people like reading books, there are very good books out there as well. Uh, there's an interesting podcast by a guy called Thomas Minch uh, in New York. His uh, podcast is called The Light Lounge. Um, and he pretty much interviews lots and lots of lighting designers and he'll, you know, they all talk about their careers and how they got into lighting design. And there are lots of tips to be had there as well. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the biggest piece of advice I can give anybody is that you know, when, when you're planning the lighting design in a space, it is not about the quantity. It is about the quality of what you're doing. So if it's really about thinking how light is interacting with the surfaces. Interior designers often go wrong um, because they look at the chandelier, they look at the product, and then they look at the geometric arrangements on plan. And they forget mm. about the three dimensionality of the space and the intangible stuff that is being given off. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, but it is it, the best advice I can give anybody is, is really think about the way people are interacting and what people are actually seeing. And it is that invisible stuff. It's how light falls upon a surface. Um, for people that are interested in residential projects, in a couple of weeks, uh, we are launching something called the dark art of lighting design. If you have a look at our YouTube channel, we have a pretty good YouTube channel with other CPDs on there as well. Um, we will be launching something and that, I think it's a six part series on residential lighting and lots and lots of tips. So that will be up there, but I don't think it's quite ready yet. Um, Okay. Uh, your so, channel is Nulty Lighting? Uh, so our, our, our website is nultylighting.co.uk. Uh, our YouTube channel, I think, if you Google Nulty Lighting, it, it'll come up, I think. We are on all good social media. Uh, at, uh, this is a proper plug, this. Um, all good social media as well uh, on at Nulty Lighting. Uh, we have a really good um, uh, Instagram page there as well. And, you know, I'm around as well. If anyone has any questions after this, you can get me on my own uh instagram page or through through the work one or through the website um you know we're always very happy to engage with people with any with any questions if we can get the world thinking about the quality of light around them then that's you know a, a huge step forward for us all understanding the impact of light and if we do use light in the right way then we can naturally save energy we can create better spaces and ultimately, you know, clients get better value for money. You know, value for money in the Middle East for too long has been about the cheapest. It's been about how do mm. I just save money? And I think mm. we need to, we, need, we now need to mature that conversation. You know, that conversation needs to move on and we need to really start thinking, well, what is value? Value isn't necessarily the cheapest. You know, value is about, um, you know, what am I getting for my, my, my spend? Whether that's in fees or in products or in design, um, and if we can if we can educate people better, then all of the architects, all of the interior designers in the room are going to be having a much more interesting conversation about you know, value of design. Uh, and the one thing I would say about value is it's also the value of time uh, for all of the architects and interior designers in the room. And, and this is a, this is a moan that I have. You know, clients often don't understand the value of time it takes to think. You know, people just come to us and say we you know we've got a project and we need it in two weeks. And uh, you know, design takes time. And I think everybody will agree, all of the creatives are here will, will probably agree that design takes time to think about and plan before we even commit to paper. Um, we, we still so, have some questions to go. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, yeah. we, we, no, that's okay. We are, we are actually <laughs> enjoying it, but we, uh, uh, we're trying to, to give them a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, we, um, I will try to, because actually the, 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 the words you just told us, it's answered many questions, yeah. uh, especially the ones that we have for designers. Um, I will just go back a little bit. There's an interesting question from Nelson. Why do you use the term artificial light versus electrical light? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, same, same. It's the same thing, you know. I mean, the truth is, there is no, there's no such thing as artificial light because it's light. Mm -hmm. You know, light is light is light is light. Um, so actually, it's a terrible term. Uh, artificial light, you know, it's, it, it really, it's, it, it really electrical light is, you know, because we talk about bioluminescent light, we talk about sunlight, starlight, it should really be electrical uh, light, if I'm honest with you, it's, um, it's, it's same, same, 
Okay. About the psychology effects of lighting, especially for the residential projects, uh, what is the best practice you advise for the designers, along with the research and reading about it? Because, you know, it's uh, understanding the psychology of the effect of lighting for residential, it's not only about the project itself, or the, let's say the standards or principles, also understanding the people mood and etc. and their lifestyle. So um, I could give a whole other CPD on this for an hour, um, so we could be here all night. Um, uh, here's the thing about design, and this, this applies to architects. If I was an architect, the same thing would, would, would apply. If I was an interior designer, the same thing would apply. Mm. The most important thing in a, in, uh, when we design is not what we're doing, it's why we're doing. It's why. So when we design, whether I'm designing a building or whether I'm designing a lighting scheme, really the same things apply. We look, we take our brief from the client and we understand, we start to work out, well, why am I doing what I'm doing? Then we start to think, you know, as lighting designers, we think we start with why, then we think with what. So why am I lighting the space? What am I lighting in the space? And only then do I think about how am I lighting the space? Mm. So we, we, we start at this kind of uh, existential kind of, well, why? What is the meaning of light? What is the meaning of life? You know, it's, it's this kind of big question. Why am I lighting? Then we start to really ha you know, um, hone down and narrow down. Uh, and it's only when we get to the how do we start talking about light fittings. So when we talk about that in a residential context, why am I lighting it? You know, what am I, you know, so let's take a, a kitchen space in a residential context. Mm. Why am I lighting it? Well, I'm lighting it for task. I need this counter to be light and bright so I don't chop my fingers off. I, I might have a dining table in my kitchen, so I, maybe I want some intimacy in there. Uh, I might have children running around and they might be using it as a bit of a playroom or something. So we start to ask, well, why am I lighting it? Because then we start to inform what surfaces we're lighting, where the, where the light is being located. We start to think about what the rhythm of light is uh, in that space, the quality of light is, and only then do we arrive at how. So to, the short answer to your question is really start to plan why you're lighting it, what you're lighting, and then how because then oh, it becomes much more interesting yeah. the dark art of lighting design covers all of that so come back and look at our youtube page in a in a couple of weeks mm. and, it, and it will be there i promise um, or follow us on linkedin because it'll be posted there if you look at the novelty lighting linkedin page uh, yeah we'll i will stuff up there yeah well. let me write it now because i will yeah. forget it and um, because it's, we have... yeah so, so again just to reiterate that point when it comes to residential so why am i lighting well actually in a residential context i often want intimacy I want it to feel romantic. You know, I'm sitting there with my wife and you know, life is good and it's cozy and, you know, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe she's ugly and I don't want to see her. Who knows? But I want to create, um, then I'll, I'll, get, I'll get slapped now. Um, uh, I mean, if I want to create intimacy, then I want pockets of light, you know? I, I, okay. you know so I, I don't want a geometric array of down lights that illuminates mm. everything. I want, you know, uh, some table lights, you know? So, you know, I, I, I would say to anybody the one tip for, for residential lighting avoid down lights you don't need them maybe sparingly maybe to illuminate a table or a piece of art mm. do not need a geometric array of down lights just put light where it's required and if we want to create intimacy put it below the eye think firelight okay. yeah you know, okay. when, we, when we, were, we were cave dwellers the, the, the fire wasn't above us it was below us so it was coming up onto the face naturally yeah we have last two questions yep. one is uh, from gabriel i just wondering what is the most interesting thing about light in powell's opinion uh, i missed that last one what's the most interesting light in what is uh, sorry what is the most interesting thing about light in powell's opinion in my opinion yeah uh well i sort of answered that before the most interesting light the thing about light for me um and i get goosebumps honestly you probably see goosebumps i love it when a space comes to life so uh, i really mean this you can see like my, my arms are standing the hairs on my arm are standing mm -hmm. up on end when you stand there with a client and in a residential context right you take them to their living room and you turn all of the lights off so they're standing in darkness and then we have a control system you have the scenes and we say right you know see uh you know um circuit number one 30 percent circuit number three 40 percent whatever and we build that composition and it's like breathing life into a dead body it is the most unbelievable experience for me because uh, because suddenly that kind of soulless piece of architecture suddenly comes to life 
and it is it's beautiful and it's poetic and it's amazing and engaging and um there's a book actually which we often give out to clients called um, in praise of shadows by a japanese mm. uh, it's called in praise of shadows by uh, uh tanizaki um and it's a beautiful book you know it's, it's about japanese culture but it talks about this sort of personality that light has and it's mm. a it's a very thin book you'll read it in an hour you know it's, a, it's an essay really rather than a book in praise of shadows it's beautiful and it is just everything I love about light because it is light has a personality and it breathes life into space. And if you get it right, then my word, it's, it's just amazing. So that's my favorite thing about light. Okay. So last question, which is to wrap up things, uh, because we focused a little bit more about interior more than exterior a little bit, but we still have, what is your advice? Let's say to wrap up this for, especially for the exterior and architecture, when designing a building, it's where, how, when to start considering the lighting design in terms of exterior elevations and facades? Um, as early as possible. And, and to be honest, everything we've said also applies to the exterior space. This is the point. Yes, we, I mean, the examples were exterior, yeah. interior, but it all applies. Um, yes. You should be thinking about like, it's, as I said, they're on artists, you know, when they're composing a space, they're thinking about what it looks like. You know, they're composing a painting, they're thinking about what that finished product is going to look like. So when architects are designing an external space, landscape designers are designing an external space, you should be thinking about that from day one. You know, mm -hmm. especially as we move, we, we, we refer to it as the light time economy. As we, we, you know, we move to a more 24 hour economy. And by, by golly, with the, the post COVID world, working hours are going to be extended. I can tell you that now because of shift patterns are going to change. Mm. Um, light has a really important part to play in that. And we need to think about how people are going to react and light and dark light and absence of light are equally important. You know, if I was being pompous, I could describe myself as a, as a dark designer because contrast is important, particularly in the external environment. So um, we need darkness to give us light. Um, and, and it is very poetic. So, um, mm -hmm. the, short, the short answer is as early as possible, you know, and it might be that you just have an initial conversation with somebody about it and then, mm -hmm. and then they don't do anything on the project until we get to stage three or four and then they come back. But really thinking about the quality of light and how that form, that three-dimensional form, that three-dimensional space is going to look like in light. Mm -hmm. It's why architects like Le Corbusier are phenomenal because that's what yeah. they're thinking. Yes, you know, yes. So it's very important actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, and um, uh, we don't think about that enough. You know, we pick up a pen, we, we look at you know, the form of the building, but we really don't think of the interplay of light on the surface early enough in the project. Yeah. Well, Paul, thank you for this amazing talk mm -hmm. and uh, very informative inf uh, information about lighting design, which is actually, we, we like a lot about it. And um, thank you for everyone who attended with us tonight. And uh, we can wrap up and close now. Do you have any other, anything else to add? Nope, that's it. I've, I've definitely uh, spoken yeah. enough. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, everyone. Well. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.